I've been at Carter's for 20 years. Uh, the company is in a 150-year-old brand. We do children's apparel. We are primarily North American based, although we are global. We have 18,000 points of distribution, so we have a little bit of complexity on our side within North America. We do 250,000 SKUs with all our different variations, and so complexity is very near and dear to my heart. In terms of my responsibility, I've been managing the operations team for the last six years, but in, in that time span, uh, we've put in connected planning. I'm now responsible for our digital strategy related to supply chain and product development. So we're looking at 3D, so looking at my neighbor here about <laughs> her technology and all the cool tools that are coming into play. So for me, uh, end to end is a critical discussion because it's about evolution, it's about transformation. Um, Amazon has changed the game in retail, so slightly a disruptor. Also a large customer of ours, so we decided to partner with Amazon rather than try to fight them. So uh, that's been working well for us so far, but uh, to me it's, it's meeting people in the industry. We all have the same challenges, we all make stuff. We're trying to get stuff faster, we're trying to get stuff cheaper. So it's just good to network and uh, talk about some of our challenges together. So my name is Lena Lim and I'm from Browseware. Um, so at Browseware, we are the um, 3D simulation um, software technology. I think what's interesting for me always to come to conferences and also to speak to people is the fact that this industry needs to change, full stop. And we have a lot of noise around digital, digital transformation, very, very big words, but what does it really mean? And I don't believe it is one software that will solve the problem, nor do I believe it is one single platform. But what I do believe is just the knowledge that is being shared at conferences, peer-to-peer uh, -peer sharing. In, because I feel that the industry needs to relook at what do we do to conduct our businesses. Um, I heard, I was just in a brainstorming session upstairs where we are, there are people still asking, how do we standardize processes? And I kind of take a step back and think about why are we standardizing processes when the world is changing so fast? Instead of thinking maybe we should be looking at agility and how can a business be agile in its processes, in its systems, in its all of that in order for us to capture where we need to go tomorrow and start today. So that's my interest in being at um, PI and, uh, and speaking to many of you, I applaud you for um, being like the early starter and just willing to just move the mile again and again. And there are lots of uh, inspirational speakers that has uh, changed the game. I don't think Amazon has changed the game by being a threat to us. I think they've just taught us how to relook at our businesses, to rethink what cost means, to rethink what getting data means, and to rethink what any of those analytics could mean for our businesses. So yeah, thank you for having us here. I love that um, instead of standardizing, but think about agility. I'm gonna take that back with me. Um, I'm Marcus Chung, I'm in charge of manufacturing and supply chain at Third Love. We're a direct-to-consumer women's intimates business. Um, I've worked at small companies like Third Love, but also larger apparel companies, where I've had the pleasure, maybe, of um, implementing various systems and specifically thinking through how do we get scale and advantage from PLM systems as well as 3D software. Um, and I think that's the perspective that I bring here is the change management aspects of that from large companies as well as small, both thinking through do you go with homegrown systems or buy something off the shelf. My name is Stephanie Benedetto. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Queen of Raw. We are a marketplace for businesses to buy and sell their unused textiles, keep it out of landfill, and help them turn that pollution into profit. I come from a family background of over 100 years in New York in fashion and textiles, so definitely grew up around it, have seen the old school way of doing things, what is broken, and in so many ways how we're still doing things the way my great-grandfather did in 1896, and definitely am passionate about and appreciate what tools like blockchain and machine learning can do um, when it comes to end-to-end -to -end digital transformation. I, in particular, want solutions that are sustainable, but by that I mean that makes sense for people, for planet, but as well for profit. And if it doesn't do that, then it just it doesn't make sense to adopt. We've seen with our own solution that we can help businesses improve their bottom line by over 15%, improve their top line with a sustainable story to tell. And in the past few months, we saved over a billion gallons of water. So um, definitely appreciate everyone being here and forward thinking and that we do have the power to change the world. 
Hi, I'm Jenny Sim from Foot Locker. I'm the Vice President of Global Sourcing in Foot Locker. So I'm responsible for all our own private label, apparel, and accessories. Um, I implemented the PLM and our sourcing portal end-to-end -end from concept to shipment. Uh, we can talk through, uh, I will share more about the advantages of end-to-end -end visibility. So before we get started, Derek, uh, in August I had three new grandchildren, so we got to talk, Carters, you know, okay? Make that happen. <laughs> Thank you. Big fan. We have Dan Berry store, by the way. So we're going to start off with asking one question, which everyone can uh, answer, and we'll go in reverse order. Okay, that's not working. So I'll do the old-fashioned way. How relevant is end-to-end -end digital to the survival of your business? Thank you. Jen, we'll start here and we'll go that way. Okay. Just one answer? No, because <laughs> Derek, said, Derek says, everybody says critical. <laughs> it is. I mean, in today's, uh, well, being in Foot Locker as a retailer, I don't think we can continue our business the way we used to do it without end-to-end -end digital systems. So Foot Locker is investing um, a very big portion of our capital on IT. We have been hiring more IT personnel than we have ever seen <laughs> in the company. So it is critical to the business. As a startup, I mean, we built our entire platform around creating an end-to-end -end digital solution for businesses. And we did that primarily because we saw with textiles alone, it was costing businesses over $120 billion a year in waste and unused products from raw materials to finished goods. I mean, that is a massive number and your businesses won't survive with those kinds of numbers in the future. Um, obviously, as we're impacted more day to day by Trump, China, trade wars, imports, exports, all the things we've been talking about here. So we use end-to-end -end digital tools that I mentioned like blockchain and machine learning to help businesses in real time identify waste, give you a marketplace to monetize that waste, but then most importantly, over time, minimize those waste streams. So I, I think end to end is absolutely critical and a game changer, but I also hope people think about when you're going towards this vision of complete end to end and 100% sustainable by a certain year, that it doesn't have to cost you a ton of money and time and resources to implement today. Some of the solutions that are available are short-term solutions that don't cost you any money and in fact can make you money and save you time and resources. And if you go after those solutions first, it makes it all much more able to be done quickly and easily. Stephanie, can you do that Trump thing again? Sound like a Billy Joel song. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, okay, Marcus, sorry. <laughs> Um, so our industry faces some pretty significant challenges and pressures today. I think everybody at this conference and every other conference that I go to, we talk about speed, we talk about cost. Um, I've been in the industry for the past almost 20 years and definitely have seen the shift from cost more to speed. And, um, you know, in a world where those two things are so important, you can't start to figure out what the opportunities are across the supply chain unless you have visibility into the component pieces that make up the supply chain. So the end-to-end -end visibility and technology is really important for you to be able to identify where you can take out cost and take out time to be able to achieve the goals um, that we're all trying to achieve. I think I read a stat someplace where, you know, of all the consumer goods in the world, across the last 40 years, apparel's the only one that's where prices have gone down. Consumer prices have gone down. Food has gone up, consumer electronics goes up, toys go up, but the pressures that our industry face um, are pretty unique, and um, if we want to stay competitive, we have to look at our supply chains in ways to be able to um, enable our companies to not only survive, but to, to thrive. Software guy here. Sure. I'll let you start. But we use your tools to survive. <laughs> um, no, so for us, uh, uh, as some of the other panelists said, 
I mean, we all know it's critical. That's why we're here. That's why we're, why we're talking about it. But um, so time for us, and to Marcus's point about speed, it's also about sustainability, and that's one of the things that our, our customers are asking more and more about. So obviously, Stephanie can speak to this better than anyone, but uh, going digital for us, we have customers, not just end-use customers, but also customers like Target, like Amazon, that are requiring this of us. To Why, why are we bringing these large pieces of luggage full of samples to sell a line when they could have looked at a 3D image or looked at something that was digital versus a, a paper line sheet? And so for us, it's the speed component so we can be more efficient, and it's also scalability. So we, we've grown, so in the 15 years that I've been with my company, we started with one brand. We now have a portfolio of six, and we're launching a seventh uh, this year with our organics line, and organic needs to be digital. So some of these things are the market is putting on us. They're forcing us to change, and it might not be the least costly method. We're having to understand that to engage that consumer, to get her into our portfolio and keep her, we're going to have to ex give her the experience she wants, and it's a digital experience. Yeah, so when you hear businesses realizing you know, how it's important for them, and it's very relevant, I think for most people coming into digital, there are a few questions that we should ask ourselves. And, and maybe through asking ourselves, we'll, we'll realize if digital is for us. I think the first question to ask is, can our business today still afford that 10, 12, 15, 18 months calendar to market? I think that's a very basic question that we have to answer. We have to answer also the questions on, you know, can we afford to continue to put about 11,000 pieces of clothes into the landfill every hour? Um, that's another question from a sustainability point of view. And the third part of it is, can this business that we are operating on continue to work on just gut feel instead of using data? Can we, should we be asking what do we do versus what is the value we want to create in the business environment that is changing today? I think if we can ask those questions, then the relevance of digital transformation for the individual business takes on more of a, uh, a personal, let's say your own value proposition for your own markets. And I think those are important questions to ask. Um, yeah. Let's stay on this one for a second or two. Is there the risk of becoming too digital. Now, I, I, I look, I watch baseball, you know, I'm not a, either a Mets or a Yankees, I like to watch baseball, and they've gone to analytics, and they put these, to me, meaningless statistics up on the screen and expect the average viewer to make some sense of it. You know, how many, how many strikeouts and this and that, and, and, and it's really gotten to the point where the managers, some of them are making decisions strictly based on the analytics. Some good, some bad, but you mentioned the gut. You know, this industry always was a gut. You know, you, what do you think? What do you think? So you're trying to remove some of that element, digitize more, become more digital. So is there some balance that needs to be made? And, and that's an open question for anyone. Everybody's shaking their head. So someone answer, uh, please. You know, you made a point, right, that the industry like to talk about what do you think. Actually, the, the, I find sometimes the underlying challenges in the industry is often how do you feel? Should we do this? Should we do that? Because if we were thinking, at some point we would use data to drive some of the decisions that we take. It doesn't necessarily mean that you get data only if you digitize completely. But if we really look around, there are data all around us. Um, I recently asked somebody, right, we have data on returns. We know them. We go on Amazon, we see what's been returned. If you sell on Amazon, they give you those data. But how many of those, how much of those data actually flows back into our product creation teams? If you knew what was being returned, if you knew a jacket was being returned constantly, all the puffy jackets, you know, zipper is bad, not enough pockets, how many of that, how many percent of those information actually make back? Comes back to the people who are actually creating the product. And this is what I mean by looking at data that is being generated and who really needs it. When we see a lot of e-commerce data today, we look at conversion. Did we convert? Did the consumer buy? You know, how many percent were returns? But we really don't dig deeper into figuring out those values that we can derive from it for our own businesses. And, and this is what I mean. You know, you don't necessarily need to go completely digital to have that. Some of those things we have, and I th it is maybe time to move away from a little bit on that, how do I feel? 
much more into that, you know, what do I think that is really value creation for our business and where can we find the existing data now? And for those that are not there, what can we do to derive that data for ourselves tomorrow? And you kind of touched on it in your, in your question, but you said, you know, I'm looking at the TV and I'm seeing all this data and me as a consumer, I don't know what it means. Well, the power of having this data, especially in an end-to-end -end digital way for a business is that we take that data and then you use tools in order to analyze it and make educated decisions. You're not leaving it up to an end consumer or someone not educated in what that data means to make an understanding or a decision or a choice. It's the business inputting a bit of, of their experience and expertise along with data. And in particular, the most exciting part to me is the dark data, the stuff you never knew before that you were touching on that now, because you have all this information connected at your fingertips, you can uncover holes and opportunities and waste that you never knew existed before. And I think it does depend on where and how you use it, but that's really where the power is. And I think the balance is absolutely what we need to strike between the human and the data. Um, I spoke a little bit, a little bit about that earlier, but um, it's also it also speaks to the skill set. And um, I remember I, I worked at Stitch Fix, and we had a team of data scientists. And um, in one of my early meetings, it was really interesting to see buyers interact with our data scientists. And the buyers were talking about confidence intervals and you know the data set that they were dealing with, well, you know, the data scientists would ask questions like, what's a jumpsuit? Um, and so, and, and it's really, it's an interesting connection point where you have to translate between the two. Um, but if you don't have that dialogue, if you don't have the skill set to understand how to interpret the data, the data is meaningless. And so going full digital um, probably doesn't make sense. But it's funny, and just what you just said, you know, people talking in a room that maybe historically wouldn't have been in the same room together. And the beauty of this concept in theory or in practice of end to end is you're bringing in the room those groups and those informations and touch points that historically weren't in the same room together. And it's frustrating. You know, when we go present and talk about our solution, originally we were just presenting to the sustainability team. And that's great, don't get me wrong, I love that businesses have that and they're big brand ambassadors for us. But we also need to be talking to the CFOs and the financial team because this is a liability to supply chain and procurement who are dealing with this issue, to the CTOs and CEOs dealing with the technology to create this end-to-end -end solution. You need all those people in the room to really make it a rich, active conversation and solve these problems. Anybody else on that one? Everybody good? Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Steph. I, I, I think you're right. And I, I, this is w one of the reasons why I, I like these conferences. You're getting people in the room that normally would not be in the room, and these conversations are starting. These are p places that you know really ideas can germinate from, and then we can move to the next topic. So, what does a truly end-to-end -end digital model mean in your business, and how will that definition play out in changing your existing business model? Uh, I, I will defer to my friends at PI; they wrote the question, so um, <laughs> uh, some of them are repetitive in nature. So we can hit them, move on, whatever you want to do. So since I jump in on the last one, I guess I'll take the, the first bite. Um, so for us, uh, the goal for us in a truly end-to-end -end digital example would be going from concept to the customer where the only physical item uh, being the end production that's, that's in the consumer's hands. So it doesn't end up on a storefront. It's not in the sample room. It's not in a strike-off. Um, it was I ideated it digitally. It was communicated to the factory base. They made the production, and then it got to the DC and ended up in the, in the consumer's hands, and that being the only piece that hopefully if she wears it uh, long enough, it won't end up in the, in the landfill. And if my demand planning team did their job, hopefully we don't have any excess. But, um, you know, we're piloting a, a, a one of, with one of our largest customers going from the traditional sales model and selling in using uh, rendered uh, 3D and 2D images. Uh, we do have fabric samples from our, our library that we keep, but they're, re they're reusable. So the, the buyers still want that hand feel. And one of the things in, in the kids' space is they want it to be soft for their kids. We, we don't want scratchy clothes on our kids. So um, that's the way we're kind of bleeding into that. But we are now sampling three different tracks of digital end-to-end -end where the only physical item, is, there's nothing on paper. It was, um, we sold it in digitally. We got the order digitally. 
and then we, we transacted it digitally, and so there's no paper involved at all. So uh, it won't be 80% of our, our business in the next two years, but it's one of those things like, it is a learning process. There is no company that has figured it all out. So we're taking those measured steps along the way, and, and we'll, we know we'll trip, but we're not gonna trip in a scale that'll be critical to our business, So and that's how we're learning. Derek, in, in that respect, uh, are you able to track cost savings? Is there, is there programs in place that are gonna look at that, and at the end of the year, you say, you know, if we sampled, we would have spent this money. If we're, we're doing digital, we're, here we are. Absolutely, so the buyers and, and the merchants, you have to overcome that fear of the art and the science, and I think Mark has touched on it too. Uh, we look at it as EQ versus IQ. Um, that's the, the balance versus art and science, because then it gets into the, artist, people take art and science different. So we say EQ, IQ. And it's just about balance. It's shifting the Venn diagram over a little bit to where you have to have a balance of both. Uh, a data scientist is never going to pick out the socks that I'm probably wearing today because my kids picked them out, but that's okay because my kids are on them. Um, <laughs> but uh, from, from that balance shift, I, I really think uh, the business model itself has to have a, a relation to the old way of working but then understand how new technologies can fit into that space. And I think if we do that successfully, the change management piece of it becomes better um, and more, more manageable. The, the end consumer is changing her behavior uh, faster than we can build models. And I think uh, uh, we talked about standards and, and a lot of the PLM um, focus here. By the time you integrate a process or, or, or a technology, it's already obsolete. So, that's where I think having that flexibility um, and understanding how digital can play into it and taking measured steps is, is the way to really adopt it. And, and when we look at, it's, it's funny we use this term end to end, right? When we think of end to end, somehow we are thinking linear processes. But if you saw what was in the kickoff slide by Rajiv, is he showed a circle, right? He showed a very collaborative um, process where at any point you are actually selling. So if I'm looking at um, Carter's, for example, what he has just described has already changed the business model for us in the, as an industry. Today as an industry, our business model is I design, I make, and I hope to sell. What he has just described is he has already made the paradigm shift to going into a I design, I sell first before I decide what I make. That's the opportunity that we have. So when you look at that business model, I think you need to kind of ask ourselves not to overcomplex everything, but what, where are we? Are we still going to be in this hope to sell? Because we're going to be in this hope to sell, then we are after, you know, how do we get anticipate better demand? How do we optimize our supply chain? How do we do all of that to get accuracy? But I, I'm not really sure that in this world where it's so volatile that you know, accuracy is even a word that we can rely on, but versus what you know, Carters have done and what um, you know, even Coles have done and many other companies is to go into an iterative mode of understanding, right, okay, we've designed this, we know this is much better than you know, ink and paper, <laughs> you know, a 3D image conjures up um, uh, the product, a digital product. Now let's try and get some voice of customers' feedback is this color gonna do it? Is this not gonna do it? Is, uh, are those customers telling us something that we should be hearing before we go ahead and do all those material planning, buying, and, and so on and so on and so on. So here in, when we look at end-to-end, -end, I guess all I'm trying to say is, I, I think we really need to relook at what that end-to-end -end mean. Um, because our business is not ending. So, but instead, it is meant as a growing phase. So as, as we are growing, what is that iterative phase we need to look at and how should we think of that? Um, and can you pay for it? And then I think that was the, yeah. the spirit of, of the question uh, that I, I sidestepped. Yeah. Because the samples piece <coughs> is one, the st sustainability, yeah. but how do you build that business case because none of these things are free? Yeah. And, and that's where finance really comes into play. I don't think there's any finance folks here. We don't want to offend you. Oh, okay. well, There's always well, one in every group. But you know, uh, from a, they I, want us to pay for these things. I agree. But I, I feel that even from a finance point of view, you really need to look at it, right? We are very hopped up on sample savings. It's great. It's a very tangible thing. And it will come as a result of just doing digital product creation. But I think much more we should be asking is, if I'm not making my top line, if I'm not selling, where am I going to get my savings from? So I really think we need to 
flip the way we thought, think of things. I mean, earlier on in your talk, right, I asked you the question, yes. right? We're looking at organic, and people think that with organic, we are going to have to sell at a premium price. Why? Why would we have to sell at a premium price when you're saving 670 gallons of water versus using 10 gallons of water? Surely there must be some level of savings that equate down, but what it really does force us to really relook at it is let, let's look at even the the finance separately if we have no top line where is the savings on the bottom line what would i rather have and what's keeping the ceo awake at night i assure you it is not just efficiency much more than that is can we sell more in the midst of this new native digital native players coming into our midst whether it's a stage fix whether it is um, you know queen of war whether it is in amazon all those digital natives are playing a different game so why should we continue to think of numbers in the traditional sense i think we really need to rethink and relook at that you're absolutely right. And when, when you look at that holistic end-to-end -end view, and I mentioned this in a previous talk, but there are blueprints out there that show those cost savings. I, I mentioned this before, but Caring, their sustainability report literally gives you over a couple hundred pages, so it is a lot to digest, but an actual blueprint for how you and where the savings come in and how to adopt an end-to-end -end and sustainable business model and save and make more money. So it, it's a powerful opportunity. Yeah, the end-to-end -end digital model is definitely um, a model that I think you still have many pieces in between, new software that will come into play. So it's not, you can implement a program that is end-to-end -end now but you are, your business is going to change so often that you're going to have to add new stuff. So it's really important, in my opinion, to have a holistic view before you even go into a model. And make sure that it is open source enough that you can add new modules as is needed, as the business change. And I can tell you from experience that having an end-to-end -end model you, you will not believe how much savings you can get along the way that you don't traditionally get. Um, and from our experience, even including shipment to your DCs, you will be amazed how much the vendor on their end would reduce chargebacks from the retailer if they do that, if they do that right. And... Um, our DCs spend much less time receiving goods into the DC. So there are many benefits on the end-to-end -end model. Yeah, I, I think you know, it's important to have a holistic end-to-end -end view. Um, I rarely talk about that internally because it's a little overwhelming to the organization. Um, I think it's really important in keeping that strategic view understanding how to prioritize across the different functional areas, understanding where the opportunities are immediately versus longer term. Some functional areas need less convincing than others in terms of being able to transition to a digital way of working. Um, and sometimes you'll get surprise pushback from areas of the business that um, you wouldn't have anticipated. So um, you can get paralyzed by thinking about the big vision sometimes. And um, you know, to me, it's always been more of an iterative approach, prioritizing prioritizing where it makes sense and you can demonstrate the cost savings or the efficiencies or other value before tackling that next piece in the company. That's great. And I think that's where the iteration piece comes into it. You have to take a stepped approach and, and do a pilot or do a, a, a sample series because if you just go all in for $4 million and finance comes and asks you for the $4.5 million payback, mm -hmm. that's typically where these things fail. You have to be able to learn along the way to be able to prove your business case out with data. Lena, you mentioned accuracy. There's always, you know, you, you, you place the PO and the question is, how much overstock are you gonna have or how many sales are you gonna miss? No one gets it right, not 100%. Yeah, you're right. No one gets it, but here, you know, we've seen topics about, you know, how do you get it more accurate and, um, I don't fault people for thinking or, or suggesting that there is possibility, but the, the, you know, and I don't know where this world is going, you know, <laughs> whether it's trade protectionism or whether it's just new way of doing business, whether it is having the Uberization of the fashion industry where you come into a sharing economy, 
Many things are changing. But um, to my first point early on, it's the agility that a business should be looking for. Even as you move into this different digital, um, digital initiatives, you should really be asking, what does this what does this initiative help us in being more agile? How does this take things away to help us to slow down and make a turn? Agility is not about speeding on. I think we, this industry has been speeding on quite too much and we're, we're kind of near the cliff. So I think it's about time that we take a stop and kind of move backward, kind of lose all the excess um, um, baggage and then relook at it. You know, Marcus made a good point. You go into uh, any company right now, you help them to, you, you think about change and it becomes, you know, I could be paralyzed with fear, right? Because either that or I'm change fatigue. We've been doing changes every six months, eight months. We've heard all of that. But on the other hand, you can take another approach. You can take an approach of using your existing business and then trying to change the little bite size, give people the confidence, take little bite sizes of value you want to create, give them the confidence, they make this one happen, now you can go on for the second one. Or you can take a different approach and say, okay, I have a lot of untrainables here. Maybe the other thing I should be doing is I should be building a new home, a new house right next door to me where I start with a framework. Let me start by laying the foundations and the foundation of my new business is by data. Things I never had here, let me go to the other house and build those data build those initiatives digital, but keep it at the framework. So I'm not asking you to go in and build the whole house and do everything, but keep it at a framework where you can now determine, okay, how has this brought us the first um, values and change the way we think? And then as business changes itself, you start building on that first brick wall, determining if you need a hurricane, you know, proof glass panel more than you do a wall or something like that. But you start building it as you go along. And over time, you'll find that you have already built your business in a new way without forcing you know, a lot of change fatigue on this side. You, you can, over time, you can move that three or four people over, that five or six, and before you know it, you have your digital transformation. And there's two ways of, of balancing that. There may even be an additional way. I'm a big fan of looking at opportunities, and if you're gonna test it, you don't even have to build it, you don't even have to try it in a small step try it through some interesting strategic partnerships. I think so much of fashion historically has been about kind of our business and the old school way of doing things and building it from the ground up or testing it in house yourself. But there are some really powerful organizations out there testing these models that you can partner with. It, it wasn't by chance that, you know, ThreadUp recently partnered with Macy's and now Macy's is in the resale business. They're testing this model. They didn't have to build an entire resale model themselves or start a take back program themselves. They're testing it. And those kinds of openness and willingness to partnerships, I think, can also be a quick and easy way to start bringing in new revenue streams and new opportunities digitally. Lena, I think we might have a new uh, series, uh, episode series for HGTV. <laughs> How to build your new plant. Right. right. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's go back a little bit to the, to the water issues, saving the water. We're talking about collaboration across the board. So, so the farmer saves something on irrigation. The spinner saves something when they're processing their yarn. The mill saves something when they're doing their finishing. How do you get everybody to say, well, this is a good thing. I'm saving some money. I'm going to pass along those costs. I think you can look at it from, uh, I could pass things along. Um, has anyone here seen this um, documentary called the, the Future of Work? No? Okay, so it's, it's, um, it's sometimes people need to come to a realization that whether or not they are along the train, something is going to, it's, it's there. So the, the documentary starts off with these three guys sitting at a bar. The guy who's creating the self-driving truck now walks into it. The journalist walks in with him and essentially said to those three truckers and said, what would you think if I told you there is a technology out there that's going to change and it will be a self-driving truck? The three guys laughed at him over a beer and said, yeah, sure, you know what? They won't be able to know how to accelerate the truck. They you know, wouldn't be able to watch out for traffic. And they just kind of went on and on questioning it. He introduced and said, well, this is the guy next to me who is going to be creating that. Then they took these three truckers out, put them on a test run to see how this all happened. They came back, they sat back at the bar, and they're speechless. 
I think this is this is sometimes the um, the future of work that we need to show our industry as well. There came a point in time when um, industrial when globalization first happened, right? It threw many people of this nation from middle class into poverty, right? There is a wave that is coming. We have this opportunity to help people in the work that they do by upskilling them to be more digital, right? No one is untrainable. It is just a matter of what is that motivation point. Is it pain? Is it motivation? Is it a trade-off? And if we can really do that, then we will leave no one behind in this train as we go into 4.0. I think that's something that is dear to the, the browseware heart. So, you know, in, in that sense, somebody was in a breakout group and says, oh, you know, the problem in software guys is that they don't ever listen. Well, no, there are new people who need to listen because without that, there is a whole other implication on job, job security. And so even when we are looking, once we are able to, to get past that, then I, I feel that, you know, this whole sharing economy of, hey, if I am able to save you whatever, give me that trade-off and I'll come along that bandwidth rather than going to that guy and say, well, you know what, I asked you to do digital, now that you have saved five cents, I want it back. I, I think we, we just need to relook at that equitable relationship from one to the other. Yeah. Now you've begun, um, like most from the digital native business to the traditional, what do you think? Well, thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> hey, I think, I you, think know, you guys are the most interesting. <laughs> um, it does, the relationships between brands and their vendors and suppliers is really an interesting dynamic when you think about size of company and phase of growth. Um, having been at really large apparel companies, I know the relationship between a brand and a vendor is much more like what you described where, hey, you're saving five cents there, I need a piece of that. Um, and at smaller companies, you don't have the leverage to be able to say, I get a piece of that, and you have to figure out a different way to um, build that relationship in a more equitable way. And think about that power dynamic as um, benefits on both sides. And so it, it's an interesting question because when you pose that, I'm like, I don't think I've ever thought about how do we get that back. Um, it's, you know, if they can find a way to save money, that's great. Um, if we can then, if they can pass it on to us in a strategic way, then that makes sense too. But it's not an automatic, like, I must save that because you saved it. And it really comes down to how you manage those relationships. Yeah, I just want to make a, a very interesting observation recently also with, in talking to the Amazon business solutions team. We think of, you know, they, they've been going out into our supplier base now for the last two to three years, right? And they've, they've been teaching a lot of these factories base in China, how to sell private label on their own platform. So it's not like Amazon is all about their private label and that they are a threat, no. They are giving this sourcing guys, people that we go to fill the capacity and they're saying, come and sell on my platform. I'll tell you with the data, what are the things that don't work very well. For a puffy jacket, I told you zipper functions and so forth. You create a brand, sell it on my platform. So we have this company in uh, this, this brand, um, and last year in New York City, there's a much wanted um, uh, puffy jacket that, that was on the long waiting list. Eight months, this factory brand sold three million pieces in eight months. He sold it at a price level between 89 was the first launch, then he went to 129 when he saw it was selling really well. Then he moved back to something like 119, right? Amazon takes 35% from that. So what? At the end of the day, he still has $68 at the FOB price. Now I asked the question here. How many of us give a puffy jacket $68 of FOB? So what is the bigger threat? Is that, is that relationship for that vendor now equitable? Definitely. Because if he sold to any brand, he probably gets it for, for $550 FOB. And I'm being kind when I say that. So if we don't look at the way we treat our vendor and our supplier base um, and sourcing strategy, then yeah, there will be another round of new threats because there are new ideas that people are thinking of giving back as well. So, 
things to think well, about. And in the future, I mean, I'm making a prediction here, but I do think that uh, going forward at some point, everything is going to be on the blockchain and totally decentralized and transparent. And so there will be no more hiding behind certain data and touch points. You're gonna know exactly what something is, where it came from, what it cost, if there was a change in the price, if there was an inventory number misnumbered or mislabeled, if a counterfeit item was slid in, you're gonna know everything and everyone is gonna know everything. Now, whether that's a good or bad thing and what are gonna be the ramifications and repercussions of that, but I think it's coming and so we need to be prepared. Yeah, on a closer look, if you think. Prediction in, here. Yeah, you but including, it. if you think, industrialization 4.0 on machineries, what is every piece of cutter, laser, embroidery ma machine doing right now? They're trying to be enabled for IoT. So if I take it even closer, what does that give visibility on when you have the IoT? It gives you immediate capacity visibility if you know how to change this up. And this, again, will change the way that we look at sourcing and we think of sourcing. So the fashion industry is notoriously creative. Who came up with the term blockchain? <laughs> and why? Someone not from fashion. Not, not from fashion. <laughs> Some IT person, perhaps. <laughs> That's not a real question. So uh, our next question, uh, you know, we've got a wide audience. And it comes down to, you know, there's an investment. Going digital costs money. When do you do it? How do you do it? Where do you do it? Does the small entrepreneur, we have a young lady in here from Dallas who's a you know, one-person show. You know, what, what do they do? What does the large organizations do? When do you pull that trigger? Not everything costs money. Uh, I do think that one, obviously, a strategic partnership. Is that another prediction? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Um, you know, and that's where the advantage, I mentioned a bit, of some of these strategic partnerships before you go in and make an actual investment can be real valuable testing and opportunities. Um, and then, obviously, with certain platforms and opportunities like ours, you're actually making money while testing some of these initiatives before you then go dive in deep. And so you can take the money you're making by solving certain problems in your own chain, finding ways to monetizing waste, and then use that money we've seen our customers to invest, and they're not actually spending anything and investing anything out of their own pockets right away. And so, um, you know, at a certain point and for certain tools, absolutely, 100%, there is investment required, but maybe you combine that with other opportunities that you're testing that don't, and it all about zeroes out. Is there any chance for barter? <laughs> Yeah, no, a absolutely, 100%. I mean, that's kind of what our whole business model is based on, the act of buying and selling in an open, free marketplace. Uh, bartering on any form, I think, is so valuable and important and something historically the fashion industry has not been as strong on, but obviously we're starting to see, and with all the recent changes in the laws and new business models and competitors coming into this space, it's going to be critical and an exciting opportunity with a lot of fun, cool new things that we can do to build our businesses and move them forward. I think, first, I believe we need to have a holistic view, as I said earlier, right, of what are the systems we need? Where are the white spaces that we need to fill that we do not have today to bring value to the business? And then, like what um, Derek said, I know we need to prioritize because the company does not have all the finance that you need to implement all the systems that we want. So I think prioritizing and then working through with all your stakeholders. And in today's IT environment, it's no longer IT alone, like we said earlier. You need everyone else to come in, look at that software and say, does that work for you? Does that work for you? what works and what does not work, how much modifications is needed, the timeline that will take to implement the project. And um, there may be, you know, like what Stephanie said, some of the software that you are going to implement can be for short, um, for the short term, you get the wins quickly, you have that big main, main program that will take two years to implement. What are the things that we can do to get the short gains first, while in the meantime, you have a team of people working on that big framework that you are hoping to launch in two years. I, I think you have to also be cautious of the small wins because um, if you are 
operating really quickly in a really scrappy way, trying to invest technology in a bunch of little places, you have to be cautious of tech debt. Um, you can get to a point two years from now, five years from now, where the organization has to undo a lot of that before it can implement a more strategic system. And so it's really important to have that overarching strategic view and sequence it properly um, because engineering is always a really precious and limited resource. You want them spending time investing in more strategic projects, not fixing bugs, not undoing um, you know, small software implementations that didn't get you the benefit that you expected. So I think that, that that's, it's a critical question. I don't know the answer, but it's really tough to um, think through like, what are the shorter term versus longer term projects and how to sequence it. Yeah, but I think your willingness to explore, like coming to conferences like this, definitely help because you can see all the other platforms that are available out there explore, explore, explore. That's what I would ask people to do because you don't jump into it. Oh, someone came and said, I have this new software. That does not mean you go into it. Find out what, who are all the other competitors that is out there and then compare all the features, all the function, right? And what you need, match that up. And once you can do that, I think you are, you are getting to a good place. So uh, to Marcus's point, you do have to be careful from uh, your technology stack getting uh, unruly and unmanageable. And that's, so for us, the way we're defining it is we have a chartered pilot and the pilot cannot expand beyond its limitations of how it's been scoped. So it, of our three pilots, one of them might win, they all might be awesome and we'll decide that as part of our roadmap of which one will proceed further. But you do have to create some guardrails because the last thing you want are six or seven competing processes and technologies running rampant in your space because that's where you get stuck. Um, so you do have to have control, you have to have governance. I mean, not to be, I, I grew up finance, so I'll agree with the one guy that I think's here in finance. Um, you do have to have structure and discipline. Being creative and innovative doesn't mean you don't have rules. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, those two things are not the same. Um, so there, there still has to be structure and, and define pilots with deliverables, help prove the business case. And that's when you get finance and IT on, on your side is, you need that momentum, you need that positive vibe, and if, if you're selling it to a team and they don't wanna change, that's a hard sell. So I think you know, we talked about where do you start, where to invest, find the team that wants to change. Find it, it, There's plenty of opportunities in digitization. Uh, it doesn't have to be PLM. You don't have to take all, tackle a $5 million PLM implementation. It could be your, your design software, it could be 3D, it could be something that enhances that, that team's uh, business process. So, that's where you get the momentum, and then they'll start asking questions. Humans are very logical. They're very inquisitive by nature. So if they find something that's cool, like how many people actually read the instructions to your iPhone? There aren't any. They send it to you in a box, and it says, turn me on here. That's it. You figured it out because you're inquisitive, and I think that's where if you take technology and use it as an enablement versus an implementation of a delivery of software, I think that's where that curiosity can actually bode in your favor. I think too often people look at um, you know software and they dive into that what are the feature and function without really asking first what is the value we want to get out what is the, the the things that are important for our business and then you benchmark not by feature and function but you should be benchmarking the the software and the technology to the things you want to you want it to achieve for you. This is something that we don't see very often. A lot of people dive very straight away into the, what does this software do? How do I do this? Let me give you an example. We, we have a very big client came to us and he goes like, you know, I need a, 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 a folding, you know, fold a digital shirt. So yeah, okay, how do you want to fold? Well, you know, I've seen this other software and they can fold it and uh, we tried it. I said, okay, how much time does it take? It says, you know, just add the function and the feature in. And I said, but just tell me how long does it take? It, three quarter of a day, but some of our best expert takes half a day. I say, how many SKUs do you do? 17,000. So how many 17,000 of half a day and three quarter of a day? Why don't you come to us? I mean, I think that for 17,000, I would create you a pipeline that automates the process, which means you continue your digital product creation. I take that asset. I find a way to automate that particular process because I need to scale. So I think we can look at technology from a tool perspective, or we can look at it from a... Um, you know, what is the value we want to drive out of it and look at it not just for the tool in itself, but with the utmost understanding on can I scale, can I automate, can I scale and integrate? I think those are the questions we need to ask. 
we, we have been uh, constantly asked to do certain things and uh, our development team is in Israel. And you know, sometimes they cringe because the clients always likes to give them the solution when all they want to do is just ask them, what do you want to achieve out of this? And then we dig a little bit more in your businesses. And from that, we understand, okay, maybe there's another way for us to do this. Yeah. So spending the money and making a holistic view is, is critical. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, we came back from summer break and our IT department was so happy. They installed smart boards in more than half of our classrooms. <laughs> The faculty were like, uh, what are we, you know, they're trying to write on a chore, you know, it's like, so they, they never brought the faculty into the conversation. So that holistic opportunity is, is, is really important. We've got a little bit over five minutes and we've got a nice group here today. So I'm gonna open it up to questions to the audience. Any questions? I know it's the last panel of the day. Hi. Um, with all the digital technology that you're talking about, where does it fit in? Where does um, the circularity of your product fit into the equation? By that, I mean you've, you've created a product, you've sold the product, but is it good enough to be recycled over and over again? Because there's not enough on the planet for continuous um, natural um, Virgin, virgin, virgin materials. So, where does the technology fit into that? I'll be honest. Chat, Marcus. Uh, um, like in the cases where we've implemented technology for product creation and development, we haven't included um, end of life circularity um, features. But the technology can help with that. I think that there's not only can you put technological guardrails in terms of you, can, you may only design with using these fibers, et cetera, but more importantly, and I think with any technology, it's the education of the user. So how do you make sure that the people who are using the tools think with that mindset or that lens to be able to access the technology in a meaningful way? And I, that can apply to circularity, it can apply to you know, many different um, aspects as well. And it's not just obviously on, on the brand and for them to be designing with circularity in mind, it's also to your point with educating the consumer on tools that you build into the product so that the consumer can educate you on what they're doing, right? And so in some clothing now you're seeing RFID threads, your QR codes, and you know, with a company called Lumia that I mentioned before, they embed some technologies so that goes to the blockchain where you know how your consumers are wearing your product and whether they're washing it and how many times, where in the world they're, they are, whether it's ripping and tearing in certain places. And then at end of life, you can actually direct them to a, a place to go recycle it or do a take back program and tell them what to do with it. And then also send them a coupon to replace that even if you take it back. So I think there are technologies, not just in the, the B2B side, but in the B2C side that are empowering this circular movement. Um, but to your question, it is important that the brands be thinking about end of life and what happens to these things, how they get disassembled, whether they take them back. Obviously, I'm sure you know Eileen Fisher is a great pioneer in this movement and has built an incredible model. Um, but what you may not know is that a lot of stuff that she does with her take back program and her recycling of her clothes is still done manually. And now she's working on digitizing it to the, your point to be able to grow and scale this model. Um, but now that brands are thinking about this, I think they're starting to see and businesses are starting to pop up with opportunities to digitize that so everybody is thinking full circle. There's a reason the Eileen Fisher um, facility is called the Tiny Factory. <laughs> so for the larger unit players, uh, so in my space, uh, consignment's a big, big opportunity um, that we see in the children's space and, and our brands luckily are, are built with a quality standard that usually survive the intended user and then some. And so we see our products really more recycled in consignment and in, in goodwill stores. Um, we don't design with a in use in mind of going into the landfill. We do make sure that our fibers, um, to the extent we have leftover raw materials, it's actually used in sealing insulation. So that's what we do. We don't put it in a landfill. But those are the types of things where you want to build it with a quality that the life of the product can be handed down either through consignment and or through donations, which lucky at our price point, we can donate a lot of units and, and not uh, kill our PL to our, still speaking to my one finance partner here. Um, 
so that's where we really look to that. Because you're right, there's not enough clothing to go around the world. And so uh, in our children's space, obviously, we don't want uh, children without clothing. So donations become on our offset for obsolescence more so than putting them in a landfill. Thank you very much. So let's have a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> if you, if you stay.